the Institute for the Study of Peak States presents the second International Psychoimmunology and Psychobiology Research Symposium. A Psychoimmunology Approach to Smoking Addiction, presented by Gaëtan Klein with Julien Roux. Uh, so we've got two speakers for our next topic. Uh, so Gaëtan Klein has helped over 2,500 people quit smoking using hypnotherapy, NLP and EFT. He's a trained therapist and wrote a book on how to stop smoking without gaining weight or suffering from cravings. Having a successful practice in Paris and internationally with a high success rate was, however, not enough to satisfy his personal quest of a thorough understanding of why people smoke exactly and searching for the best possible method to eradicate this problem. As a researcher at the Institute, he'll give you a peak insight of the current state of research and enthusiastic perspective on future treatments. He's going to be joined by Julian Rue, he's a certified trauma and peak states therapist, a researcher and future trainer at the Institute. His research interests include Kundalini, smoking addiction, anxiety, HIV, the minimal sleep state and the beauty way state. So Gaetan and Julian, over to you. Yes, hello, can you see me? We can. All right, perfect. So it's really an honor to be here today, just like last year. And I'm gonna share my screen for the presentation. All right, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on smoking addiction. And thank you for joining on this quest for understanding the root cause of tobacco addiction, which personally has been a quest for me for the last 10 years or so. And I'm gonna to present today the results of our team. And the team is uh, composed of Dr. Mary Pelliser, Julien Roux, Rita Embrahim, and myself. So why is it important to talk about tobacco and the research? Well, because tobacco kills 8 million people each year. Yes, each year, that's a lot of people. Um, last year in 2020, 60 million people died on earth. Of the 60 people, 8 million was, uh, it was be because of tobacco. So it's a big deal. If you compare to COVID-19, I think it killed uh, less than 3 million people so far. So tobacco kills a lot of people every year. It's a big problem. And it's not just a problem because, of, because it's killing people, but because the quality of life um, that it takes out of you is, um, is huge. And it's pretty dim because when we look at the statistics, we can see that 50% of people who smoke all the time regularly actually die from it. And of those 50%, 50% of them before the age of 65. So that's a big deal, right? And we know that tobacco is bad. We keep hearing it over and over. We have all these prevention campaigns. We know that tobacco contains a lot of harmful toxins. Some of them cause cancer or contribute to cancer and some are radioactive like polonium. And we, we've studied this you know, for decades and decades. And so we know that tobacco is one of the leading contributor to heart diseases, respiratory diseases, cancer. So some of the, the strongest um, diseases that kills a lot of people. And in most country, um, tobacco is the number one avoidable cause of death and of poor quality of health. And depending on how much you smoke, there are a lot of statistics about it, but your life expectancy um, can be decreased up to 14 years. If you smoke a pack a day for your whole life, you lose a lot of years of life. So it's a big problem. So what can we do about it? And in addition to the health side of it, which is very important, um, it's also interesting to look at the economic cost of smoking. So if you take the overall uh, expenditures and the productivity loss um, that smoking creates, globally, it, it's estimated that it's costing us 1. Point, I'm not seeing it, 1.4 trillion US dollar per year. 
that's not millions, that's not billions, it's trillions. That's a lot of money. And imagine if we could, instead of wasting that money into deteriorating our health, imagine if we could invest it in medical research or other positive outcomes. That would really change the world. So why do people smoke? That question has been in my mind since probably I'm six or seven years old because my own parents um, both smoked. And I couldn't understand why because it doesn't make any sense, right? It's ruining your health, you're aging faster, you can have horrible diseases, it costs you a lot of money, and it stinks. But people still seem to love it. However, for people who are non-smokers, when you look at smokers, you, you just don't understand why they're doing this. It's, it doesn't make sense. It's really bad. So it's always been a question for me um, to understand why do people harm themselves? Because it's not logical. Why would you harm yourself? And I could not understand the benefits that they seem to be getting from it because rationally, there is no benefit to smoking, right? You're just injecting yourself a lot of toxins. So what was the cause of it really? And that had led me on a, on a road to understanding this and studying different models. So if you want to understand the cause of addictions in general, you will generally stumble upon different models depending on where you study this. And depending on the paradigm you have, the tools and the model you use, you will see a different side of addiction and try to understand and make sense of it within that paradigm. And generally, people who study addiction are either psychologists and or biologists or sociologists a little bit sometimes. But mostly it's, it's divided between psychology and biology. Let's take a look at it. So is it psychological? Would people be smokers and get attached to smoking because it's in their mind, in their psychology? Well. There's a lot of arguments that would say, yes, probably, because there's a lot of psychology in the relationship that people have with smoking. And very often, if you talk to smokers, they would say, you know, smoking helps me, it relieves my stress, it helps me cope with my emotions. When I'm feeling lonely, I smoke and I feel better. When I'm frustrated, I smoke and, oh, I feel better. When I'm anxious, nervous, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel better, whatever the emotion I'm, I'm having um, trouble dealing with, actually. And if you go deeper into that, people will tell you sometimes, actually very often, that they have an effective link to cigarette. Like, cigarette is almost their friend. Ah, oh, when something is going wrong in my life, I can always rely on cigarettes. Cigarettes help me. Cigarettes are always there for me. They never disappoint me. They talk about it as if, as if it's a real person which again, doesn't make sense for non-smokers because it's just an object, right? But people have such a strong relationship with it that it explains, it, it's almost as if they are in love with a cigarette sometimes. And if you go even deeper in the psych psychological layers, you very often find that people identify themselves with being a smoker. And they would say, you know, I'm a smoker. I've always been a smoker. I will always be a smoker. That's just part of my personality. My dad was a smoker. My granddad was a smoker. In the family, we're all smokers. Or they will tell you things that show that they identify with, with this very strongly. So of course, um, if people have this identification or this affective relationship or all these psychological reasons to hold on the addiction, they get very addicted. Because if it, if it helps you um, become more confident, relieve stress, feeling less bored, or if it helps you initiate seduction with people or feel better in a group, it has so many positive benefits that, of course, you do it and you do it often. But again, it doesn't make sense, right? Rationally speaking, why would it do that? Why would smoking something make you feel so many positive emotions? Well, there's a lot of methods that are based on this to 
teach people or train them to change their beliefs or um, their, do some emotional work about it or change their relationship with cigarettes. So there's a lot of methods that are based on psychological um, changes to help people get rid of this addiction. Um, of course, I've been practicing this myself for a long time. I've helped a lot of people with hypnosis. Originally, that's how I, I was trained. And then I switched to EFT. I even wrote a book about it, which is called um, uh, I Free Myself from Smoking with EFT. It's in French. Sorry, it's not in English. But anyways, this book is already outdated. I'm going to tell you why. But this book was about helping people identify the emotional parts, the emotional connections between smoking and feeling better. When I'm feeling bad, I smoke. And then when I smoke, I feel better and helping them to uh, untie those, those bounds so they can you know, um, stop smoking easier. So generally, these types of approach work very well. But that's not all of the story. Some people would say that smoking is all psychology. And I had a bias towards that. I, I can admit it. But some people would say, no, 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 no. It's biology. Nicotine is addictive. Once you get nicotine into your system, you have receptors that get trained in your brain to look for nicotine and get rewarded with dopamine when you get it, and it gets more and more addictive. OK, so let's say that smokers smoke because nicotine is addictive. Um, OK, but how does it work exactly? Why would a molecule get into your brain and your brain is not smart enough to identify that this molecule is of no use. Why would the brain become addicted? This is what is exactly the mechanism? When I was looking into it to try to understand really what was going on, I found most of the models that are based mostly um, on neurotransmitters being pretty disappointing because you don't have so many neurotransmitters in your brain, right? You have four major ones and a few um, additions to that. But you want to explain everything with neurotransmitter, you always find something that is going wrong with dopamine or serotonin or GABA, of course. But how does that explain why some people get addicted and some people are not addicted? And I refer to the work of Jean-Paul Jean Tassin, who is a neurobiologist and who actually uh, went deeper into these models of studying the neurotransmitters. And he analyzed that there is the models that should explain addiction from, from this point of view actually don't work very well. Um, you have references at the end of this presentation, so I'm going fast here. But basically, neurotransmitters models don't make much sense. Um, one argument for this is 10% of deaths are due to passive smoking. So think about it for a minute. You can die of having received so many toxins that it kills you. However, you never become an active smoker. So are you immune to nicotine or what's going on? Why, why does it happen? And why do people have such large differences in their reaction? Some people smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. Some people just smoke five cigarettes a day and they can stop whenever they want. Why is there such a wide range of reaction? So biological model doesn't seem to be very efficient in explaining this. And if you want to delve deeper into the neurobiology of this, um, there's a great book uh, written by Anand Frank and Riven Dar, um, a critique to nicotine addiction. And it's basically a, a meta-analysis and a review of the literature on nicotine addiction. And when they look at it really well, they find that those studies and those models are not really satisfying. And there's a lot of bias and a lot of methodology issues. So it seems that we accepted this model because you know, in the 50s, when it came out, nicotine is a source of addiction. And you're addicted to nicotine. And that's why you crave the product. It seemed to make sense in the paradigm of that time. But if we look at the studies, they're actually very often disappointing. One of the most important bias, for example, is that most studies are made on mice. And we administrate to them the nicotine in a diluted solution 
of water, but very often with sugar. So if you study addiction and you're mixing two products, sugar and nicotine, and you know that sugar is very addictive because it has a new utility for the body, the body can use it. And you know, we know it's very addictive. How can you compare if the mice are getting addicted to nicotine or to sugar? Well, you don't. Um, another argument, would smokers inject themselves with nicotine directly? Would they take something and put a needle in their arm with nicotine? No, they never do that. They only do it when they want to stop smoking and actually doesn't work very well. We know that nicotine patches have an average success rate of 15%. So if you have a biological model that seems very thorough, very neat, and yes, this is how it works, and the method that comes out of it has 50% 50 success rate, um, well, I find it disappointing. So what's causing smoking? Is this social cultural? Is there something going on at that level? Well, we know that most smokers either start to imitate their peers, they imitate their friends, they imitate the group of people they want to belong to, or they rebel against authority and uh, maybe the, the values of the society and they want to uh, assert themselves in some way. So there's a lot of cultural things that seems to be going on. Um, but not of all smokers start smoking for this reason. Um, this is something that has been very uh, prominent in the marketing. Um, of course, marketers try to sell cigarettes by linking them to cultural values like manliness or being independent or being sophisticated for women and so on. So does this have an impact? Hmm. Now, if we look at the distribution, the prevalence of smoking in different populations, we see a lot of differences. So I just um, chose a few countries here, but you can see that in Canada, 15% of people smoke, in the US, 17, in Panama, it's only 6%, in France, it's 27, in China, 25, in Greece, 42%, in Australia, 14%. So why is there such a big difference? What, what are the factors at play here? It's interesting to look at it, right? Because it's data. So we have these different models, but very often these models are exclusive to one another. They don't really work well together. So you, you're kind of having to choose between one of them. But the model is only good to the point where it leads to practical application. So what actually works? So I found a very um, in-depth meta-analysis that compared uh, 633 studies on um, almost uh, 72,000 people. So what you have to look at here is the mean quit rate. This is the number of people who quit smoking after they've done something. And the most efficient method to stop smoking, you know what it is? is to have a heart attack. Cardiac patient, that means people who had a heart attack. So if you smoke and you have a heart attack, um, if 100 person would have a heart attack and they're smokers, 42 of them are going to stop. And they have a good reason why, because if they keep smoking, they might have a second heart attack and die. But 58% still continue to smoke. And um, that's pretty dim and pretty sad that the best method to stop smoking is um, to go to the point where it almost kills you. Now, the second best technique is hypnosis. Um, that doesn't surprise me because I've been training hypnotherapy. I've been using it a lot. It works pretty well. However, the mean quit rate is still 36%. And honestly, that's disappointing, right? Because We've seen before that smoking is such a big issue that it's, it's a big health problem. We want, we want people to quit. But if you only have 36%, that means that a lot of people are still addicted. So the methods are not working very well. Uh, another method that is working is having um, pulmonary diseases. So it's mostly 
obstructive chronic um, bronchitis, it means you'll suffocate to death. If you go to this extent, well, there's a 34% chance you will quit smoking, but again, 66% uh, of people keep smoking. So you can look at this, um, at this method. Acupuncture works pretty well. Um, aversion techniques uh, work pretty well. And then you have educational techniques that work a little bit. And then you have the very disappointing ones. Medication um, was very promising when it came out, but actually it only works in uh, less than one out of five people. And nicotine gum also are in this category. And the worst method is to listen to your physician if he has no knowledge of addiction. That's actually the worst method. But overall, all of these methods the best of what came out and was created, everything is averaging 26%. So that's really bad. That's not enough. So there's a critic to this because this uh, meta-analysis is 30 years old. I didn't find something that was more recent. Hopefully things have progressed in the last 30 years, um, but I'm not aware of any other meta-analysis that's more recent. Anyway, 30 years ago, things were not very bright. So as a conclusion to that, um, neurobiology has not found the correct model and the efficient solution for smoking addictions yet. I'm pretty um, you know, uh, strong on this, but I mean it. If only a quarter of people um, stop smoking and the three, three quarters keep smoking, your model is not just very efficient. So. We have a great model and we have made great breakthroughs in other diseases as you've seen before in the conferences. So we thought, hmm, what if we look at it? What if we look at addiction from uh, the prism of subcellular psychobiology? And actually we've had data and experiments on addiction years ago. The premise here is that we study what's going on inside our cells. And we think that the body problems and the neurological problems very often uh, originate from cellular problems. So instead of looking at the brain and trying to understand the addiction in the brain or something else, we look inside the cell. That's basically the model that we're using. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Julian, who leads the research team on this. But the goal was to find and to, have the, to test the hypothesis could subcellular biology um, give us a model that explains all the data we've seen in other categories? So Julian, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. So and then we find uh, two pathogens that seem to be responsible for the smoking addiction. So that would explain the psychological aspect of that, the biological aspect, and also the sociological aspect of the smoking, in fact because that creates an addictive behavior for people to smoke and smoke. So what we find is like two parasites that interact together. So one that is an addiction amoeba is an amoeba inside the cell uh, that is really driving the, the addiction for the fungus to, to be triggered and activa activated. And this fungus that we name tobacco fungus, this one is really interacting with the mitochondria and create the craving and the reward for tobacco. So that's very interesting to see that. And those pathogens are releasing toxin, different ones that have a positive feelings as reward. So as you can see, there's a pathogen that mimic some, some uh, good feeling and rewards. And so the person can think, can think that it's themselves that, oh, I'm feeling good now, but it's not really them. So this, those positive feelings uh, create a strong pressure for, for the person, the host to OB and so to smoke, because if they don't smoke, they are frustrated, they are anger, and they feel other negative emotions to not be able to smoke. So like, I, I need to smoke, I do what I want my body, my body, uh, I need to find a cigarette now to smoke, so this kind of behavior. So a classic uh, donkey carrot stick model. 
So give your cigarette to have your pleasure or sense of relaxation. Um, so the pathogen that leads the person, the host to believe he voluntarily choose to do this. So, oh no, I, I, it's my free will. I'm smoking because I want to smoke. And in fact, in, in what we observe in the cell and what we discover in research, it's not the case. It's really the pathogen that drives the need to smoke. So there is no choice there. It's the illusion of, of choosing to smoke and but not in reality what we observe. So our model suggests that all emotional and behavioral, behavioral aspects, so identification to I'm a smoker, habits, uh, lack of willpower, I can't resist to smoke right now, I need to smoke, are really secondary or post rationalization and will automatically set off once we get rid of the pathogens, that's our theory. So one of the main thing is the fungus, the tobacco fungus is in some way affecting the mitochondria metabolism, really disrupting it by, send, sending, by sending some uh, little fungi that will attach to the mitochondria and disrupt his, his way of, of uh, getting nutrients and creating energy. And we know that mitochondria are linked to solar plexus, breathing and energy production. So that would explain also the craving for smoking specifically because there is a sense of the breathing and inhalation linked to the mitochondria and the, uh, this aspect. Uh, also, we know that nicotine is a stimulant for the nervous system, but also it affects the mitochondria. So there, there is a, a link there. It's also similar to caffeine, the, the way the brain is reacting to nicotine. So like we said previously, for us, the behavior to smoke, for us, it's, it's a pathogen behavior that we are experiencing. So quickly, because we, Tom is pretty gone now, so we can see on the left the addiction amoeba. So the red thing is the addiction amoeba that, that drives the blue thing that is the fungus. And this fungus is releasing fungi that will attach to the mitochondria. You can see the, the, the stuff. And yeah, and so like I said earlier, the tobacco fungus so is really enmeshed into the primary cell nuclear membrane, and from there it sends fungi to the mitochondria to collect nutrients. That's what we think. And also, uh, interesting stuff that we observe is like when so someone smoke, it seems like the smoke is like going to the, this fungus. And in like the fungus is breeding the smoke, like so, like the behavior of smoking. So, very interesting. Um, and yeah, so we don't know yet if the fungus on the nuclear membrane is perforating the membrane, so creating pain, head pain, or if is it's just using the the nuclear pore to to uh, have the, the nutrients so the fungi enter entering or going away from it. We need to research on that. So again, a, a quick uh, review of that. And yeah, so as you can see, both pathogens are very addictive for the person. And in worst case scenario, as Gwen was saying, it's like we really want them. And so we are ready to die for, to keep them inside us. So yeah, so Shane, uh, is it okay for the time? Yeah, a couple more minutes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, so um, now it's like Gaetan, take the lead again for the final words. All right, thank you. So we have the model, we have observed things in the primary cell. Now can we derive practical applications that actually works? And we've been doing some testing lately. So here are our preliminary results. Um, so we thought we hypothesized that eliminating the amoeba itself would actually lead to results. So we worked on finding the epigenetic damages and work on them. And unfortunately, that did not really lead to great results. So there was a reduction of the overall problem, but not really good results. So then we tested, can we eliminate the epigenetic damages related to both um, parasites? And it looks like we can get immune to these 
these two parasites. And for the one person we tested, the smoking addition was greatly reduced, but not completely eliminated yet. So our next test, our next test would probably be to try to get rid of the fungal infection only and look at what it does. And we will be looking for new volunteers for that. And to look also for all the cofactors. So one of the cofactors are copies. So I'm going to go very quickly because we're running out of time. Copies can imitate the craving and the behavior to smoke and seems to be what's driving the friendliness of smoking with other people. So we um, tell about copies in the book, Subcellular Psychobiology, as a diagnostic handbook. And in preliminary results again, eliminating the copies led to a significant decrease in the urge and the pleasure to smoke, but not an elimination of the behavior. So we're still looking um, to, um, to see what it does if we eliminate them completely and the relationship with the pathogen. So here are a few observations to um, finish this presentation. The fungus itself we've seen is present in most people, even non-smokers. But then it seems to be coded in some sort of productive buyer. And it seems to be our organism trying to counter the action of the fungus and imprison it in some way. And Maybe that explains why some people can quit and restart and why some people are not smokers but could start smoking if something is triggering their life. Maybe that's um, how it goes. A second observation is the amoeba itself looks like tar. And from our model, we think that maybe if we can eliminate this, this would lead to maybe an increasing of the resilience in the lungs. Maybe the lungs could be able to um, clean itself from the tar. We have not checked this yet, but this is an observation that we want to look at in the future. Um, related to our work on peak states, we know that these um, parasites are since a substitute for peak states. So what happens if we eliminate them completely? We haven't explored it completely due to safety issues. Now, the questions that are still very important in our research is, does it work on all tobacco addictions, chewing, vaping, and so on? From the model right now, I think that it would. But what about other addictions? What about cannabis, which is very often associated with tobacco? What about sugar? We know that a lot of people who are addicted to tobacco are also addicted to sugar. Is there a link or is it just um, correlated? And what about the other addictions? Um, we haven't had time to look into it, but this is definitely something we want to do in the near future. And again, it seems like the fungus is collecting nutrients from the mitochondria. And does it explain why people smoke? We're not sure exactly, but um, it seems to be the dynamic. So we want to verify that. And last question that we have is, is it a problem that is inherited from a parents, uh, the paternal side or the maternal side or both? Does it have an impact on making the process faster? That's just where we are at in the research uh, thinking. So the next step would be finding something that works and testing within the Institute for safety, efficiency, stability, and easiness, just like was described in the previous talks. And then to do some beta testing with smokers, um, we would love to do a clinical study and then to release it to the general public. If we find some things that work, better than 42 percent uh, you know of people who have heart attacks uh, that would be already great but we will aim for something much better than that so this is where we're at we don't have a lot to you know to show for now we don't have a lot of results we don't have proof that uh, we don't have a proof of concept but this is where we're at and where we're heading so thank you you can see the references uh, later on after the talk and if you want to contact any one of us, you have our emails here. So thank you. And sorry for the time. That's OK. Uh, you started five minutes late, so that's fine. Thank you very much, Gaetan and Gillian. Uh, it's very exciting. I uh, hope we really do come up with a, a treatment for smoking addiction. Uh, millions yeah, of people so around the world will benefit from that. Especially in one month, so one month of research. So it's mm -hmm. pretty new for us. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's great. So there was a question, but you actually covered it in your wrap up, uh, Gaetan. So well done. All right. So let's move. Thank you for watching. 
For more information, visit pickstates.com.